Hey, super scientists, we're looking at 8.4 absolute age. So we're going to examine the methods that are used to determine absolute age of rocks. So absolute age is a term that we're going to be looking at, and that is referring to how old an igneous rock is. So remember your stem, IGN, refers to fire. So igneous rocks are going to be formed from lava or magma cooling. So the absolute age is the number of years since an igneous rock was formed. And as we're examining absolute age, you can also look at the radioactive material that can be found in isotopes. So that will give you an indication of the age of fossils. So during radioactive decay, elements are going to break down. So you start with an unstable atom, for example, uranium, and as it breaks down, it's going to release energy. So that's where the radioactive part comes into play. It's releasing a lot of energy, gamma particles, beta particles. And as that energy is released, it's going to transition into a different atom. And we're going to look at a couple different examples of those. So most atoms are going to be stable but some aren't, and the ones that are not stable are going to be considered radioactive elements. So most of the atoms that we come in contact with, like oxygen, gold, iron, things like that, are stable and they are not radioactive. Otherwise, that would be a problem. So radioactive decay is going to look at the half-life. So as we're talking about absolute age and determining the age of rocks and fossils, we're looking at radioactive material, so the atoms that are left on an element that have not decayed yet and are still radioactive. So you have this beautiful little graph here that's looking at the decay of a radioactive element. So we start out with this blue section here, which is the amount of the radioactive element that you have, and the light blue is the amount of the new element that is formed as that radioactive element is decaying as it's breaking down. So as we look at the half-life, just think of half as half is 50 percent. So we start with 100 percent of the radioactive element and after a half life, after a half of it has broken down, we end up with only 50 percent of that radioactive remaining. So what happened to the other 50 percent? Well, it was you had energy emissions of that radioactive, those radioactive particles, so you end up with 50 percent of the new element that is formed as that radioactive element is breaking down. So what's half of 50? Half of 50 is 25. So now we have 25% that is remaining of the original radioactive element, and it has transitioned into 75% of the element that it's breaking down into as it's releasing energy. What's half of 25? 12.5%. You guessed it. So 12.5% is what's remaining of the radioactive element, and you have 87.5% that is uh, the new element that is being broken down into. So you can see you have this decline in the graph here. Clocks and rocks made a rhyme. So radioactive dating is going to be used for igneous rocks. It's going to be used for igneous rocks because you know when those rocks form. They have a specific time that they form when that lava or magma is emitted and then cools down into a hardened rock. So here's some examples of different types of radioactive elements and you may have heard of some of these before and of course we've talked about the periodic table and all the elements so you definitely have heard of their names. This is the amount of uh, years that is the half-life for those particular radioactive elements. So for example, the half-life of carbon-14, which is used in archaeological, um, dating archaeological materials or artifacts, is 5,730 years. So that's the half-life. That's how long it takes for half of that element to be remaining, for 50% of it to be carbon-14 and 50% of it to be the new element that it's transitioned and broken down into. And it is going to be used, carbon-14 is going to be used for dating materials that are between 500 to 50,000 years old. So here's another example just to give you a visual. So here's a rock. It contains uranium, the element uranium, and the element lead. So this one, we have 100% uranium, as you can see, as indicated by the key. And after a half-life perhaps has occurred, uh, half of that uranium is remaining, so you have the red dots for the 
for the uranium, and then you have the blue dots that indicate lead. So uranium is breaking down into lead. So it's emitting energy and emitting that radioactive material, breaking down into lead. So carbon-14 is very commonly used in radioactive dating. Carbon-14 is going to break down into nitrogen after a half-life of about 5,730 years. All living materials are going to have carbon in them. We have carbon in our bodies. And plants are an example of an organism that has um, carbon in it as well. So plants are going to uh, get carbon from carbon dioxide. Remember, the plants take in carbon dioxide for photosynthesis. Animals, including people, we're going to get carbon from eating plants or eating other animals that have eaten plants so that carbon has transferred up the food chain. Oh, carbon cycle, flashback to ecosystems. So carbon-14 has, uh, in this number here, 14 is indicative of the atomic mass. So remember that on the periodic table, the atomic mass a lot of times is going to be a decimal number. So the reason why it's a decimal is because it's an average of all of the isotopes of those elements. So the 14 indicates that this particular isotope of carbon that's radioactive has approximate um, 14 as the atomic mass. So that indicates that instead of the um, amount of neutrons being six, the amount of neutrons would be eight, and that's why it's radioactive and unstable. So uranium-238 is another example. So this one is used a lot of times in determining the absolute age of rock layers that are going to have really old fossils in them, so really old rock layers. So the uranium-238 is radioactive. It has a super long half-life. takes about 5 or 4.5 billion years for it to break down. Now that's almost as old as the Earth. The Earth's about 4.6 billion years old. So it takes a really long time for it to break down for its half-life. And as uranium breaks down, like we were looking at the rock picture just a minute ago, the uranium is going to break down into lead. So uranium is going to be useful for dating rocks and fossils that are really old. So if you look at this graph, it's similar to the one that we were looking at a few minutes ago, the amount of uranium is declining with each half-life, but the amount of lead will be increasing because that uranium is breaking down, releasing energy, and transitioning into lead, the element lead. So determining the absolute age of uh, rocks and comparing that to sedimentary rock layers is one way that scientists can determine the age of sedimentary rocks and the age of fossils that might be contained in them. So we have in this picture a red stripe that indicates an extrusion. An extrusion is going to be an area where you have magma that is deposited. So basically volcanic eruption or magma chamber has a release of that hot melted rock, that hot molten rock. So as it gets uh, released, it's going to deposit, cools down, and you have this extrusion that gets formed in this example. So according to the law of superposition, which we'll talk about later, the extrusion is always going to be older than um, the material that forms above it. So this extrusion was formed prior to the shale or the sandstone forming. You also can have um, igneous rock formations that are called intrusions. So X means outside or out in as an intrusion refers to in or within. So this intrusion is basically where you have a fissure or some kind of crack or break in the rock surface or an earth surface and that lava gets forced up into it. It gets pushed up into rock layers. So this intrusion cuts through these rock layers, particularly this large layer of shale. So this shale was deposited first before the intrusion formed. So in this order of rock layers that we have, this brown layer was deposited first, and then this extrusion, and then the shale and then the intrusion was deposited next. We know that the sandstone formed on top because the intrusion doesn't cut through the sandstone. The intrusion does not go up through the sandstone. So scientists can use absolute age and relative age, which we'll talk about later, to determine the age of rocks and fossils. So 
this is a huge sedimentary rock layer, some nice stratigraphy, very colorful. So the dating of the volcanic ash is what's going to indicate our absolute age. And then looking at different methods of determining relative age, which we'll talk about again later, um, that helps us to figure out how old these rock layers are. So for example, if we know the age of this extrusion, this igneous rock, it's approximately 545 million years, then we know that the trilobites had to have lived after that. They had to have lived after this rock layer was deposited. So you determine the age of the, the absolute age of igneous rock and that'll help you to figure out the age of other rock layers around it.